uh, with Juana Suarez on precarious archives. And I would like to ask you to come sit up front with us a bit because we actually want to talk to each other and have a discussion. And the room is very big and a bit gray. And I feel I lonely and isolated. Exactly. So come sit with us a bit. I'm going to make you work together sooner or later. So. Yeah. Okay. I think I will give the word to you, Juana. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Juana Suarez. And I am a professor at New York University. I am the director of the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program. I did a presentation earlier today with another hat as a consultant for Pro Imágenes. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, political ecologies and the precarious archive. I'm in the process of writing a book, so this gathers a little bit uh, part of my research methodology that is based on human subjects <laughs> and contact of human subjects with the archive more than machines. Um, so I, I want to start by um, acknowledging the hospitality of our African uh, colleagues, African people that are working with us, for us, um, at this hotel and at this conference center. Uh, most of the research that I do share commonalities because I come from Colombia. I had lived in the States for 30 years. I'm sorry, Juana, to ask you to step back into the lights a bit because it's not very well. Okay, seen. but I'm going to be moving, so uh, it's, uh, it's fine if people get ghostly voices. People are used to hear podcasts and stuff without faces these days, and the light is a little bit like whatever. Um, so uh, I, I lost my thread of thought. Really, if I am not in the video, it's fine. Yeah, the images are more important. That being said, I'm going to move here because I cannot see with that light. Sorry. Um, so I was saying that I want to acknowledge the hospitality of South African people. Most of the research that I do, because I come from Colombia, South America, um, shares a lot of commonalities with histories of colonization and post-colonialism because we have uh, a lot of Af African diaspora and their, their work their contributions are important and should be highlighted, uh, should be a priority in any kind of work that we are doing to share national legacies. Uh, we currently have for the first time the first Afro-descendant president, vice president, Francia Marquez, and um, we, you know, Spanish is a genderized language. We use masculine and feminine, so she always says thank you to her ancestors and ancestras, no? to the women and the men that were before her. I also want to give you a little bit of, I'm going to tell you what I'm, what I'm going to try to do. If it is a failure, we'll rejoice together. If it works, we'll celebrate together. Um, I'm a professor, so I try many things. Sometimes, I know that the favorite part of my students is what's the song of the day. Yeah, that I know. Because um, it's also like a way to connect with them, and that's why we were listening to reggaeton, celebrity, bad bunny. But I, it's also part of the context that I want to offer before we go to the workshop. And I have noticed that Fiat Ifta is highly known by people transacting and doing pitches and acquiring services and selling things. So if we have time, I will sell a product to you. <laughs> Okay, to see who wants to work with us and my students. But I'm gonna concentrate on number one and number two. I'm a little bit curious on, I know I have people from Spain, I know I have people from France, um, Ireland, what other countries? Australia. Australia? Austria? Netherlands? Netherlands? Netherlands. South Africa? Netherlands? <laughs> Netherlands. Yes, Netherlands. Netherlands, okay. <laughs> I go very often to Amsterdam. I work a lot with Giovanna Fossati, and I am a very good friend of Erwin, uh, who used to work with you guys, and I just saw him. So <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a little bit of a context, because if not, the questions that I'm gonna ask and the, the results that I am going to show make no sense to you. So I wanna start by saying that this is called political ecologies, 
and the precarious archive because concerns for the archive, use and circulation of images and archives, the social media imperative are at the core of this workshop. I want to offer some specific context as a foreground before we move to a specific workshopping and questions. First, I wanna make clear that my area of expertise and my area of work is Latin America. For this project, I have interviewed a couple of African archives, but because I don't know the setting. This is the first time that I visit Africa. Um, I am going to refrain to use them a lot in my presentation today because I think it's very important not to take the National Geography, Geographic approach and actually go to places. And when you go to a place and experiment the place, you get very different conclusions than just seeing it through visual reality or a video or something like that. So the, the, my, the base for this research is Latin America. How many of you had visited countries in Latin America? One, uh, what countries? Argentina. Isla Margarita in Venezuela, very beautiful. Brazil. Oh, wow, I'm jealous. Not even me. <coughs> Never been to Bolivia. <clears throat> so, mm, so I also, um, so I want, I want, I won't be using the results because I don't know the territory really well, and I also want to dehomogenize the notion of the global south, which is a, country, a concept that I oppose. I'm not going to get deep into anthropology, history, and sociology here. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about that. And I also want to talk about where the research that I am doing comes a little bit from. This is what you watch already, El Apagón. We're going to go back to that. That's the program that I direct. And our program has something called Ar uh, Archival Preservation Exchange. And through that program, we had gone to Ghana, 2018, Colombia, Uruguay, Chile, uh, the south part of Spain, uh, Cartagena, which is very different from uh, Cosmopolitan Barcelona or Cosmopolitan Madrid and other cities, um, very much oppressed by the flux, you no, know, the migration, like the border situation that we have in the states. We have work in Brazil. In Brazil, we celebrated a 10-year summit. Um, we have work in Puerto Rico, in Colombia. Uh, during the pandemic, we did a program with Colombia online and another program with indigenous communities in Brazil and Mexico online. And this year, we work with a community in Chiapas, uh, Mexico. So this, um, this is a project that um, I think it's better if we read the slide. The Archival Preservation Exchange promotes international collaboration and academic dialogue on film and media preservation in order to safeguard the world's audiovisual heritage. APEX is an opportunity for members of the international audiovisual archival community to exchange knowledge and skills in inspection and care of audiovisual materials, cataloging, metadata management, digitization, digital preservation, and access to collections. is based on equal collaboration, dialogue, consensus of actions to be taken, and it is based on good practices for community development and on the notion of horizontal value, where we honor everyone's knowledge, skills, and contribution. So I could think it's because I am a migrant in the United States. When I wrote my second book, I defined myself as a cultural coyote. You know, coyotes are these people that bring illegal citizens from Mexico, illegal, no, undocumented citizens from Mexico to the States. And I think that when you are a migrant in a big empire, you're always like a coyote bringing culture back and forth. Uh, but our program, which is the participants from the states are mostly students and alumni and professors from the university and people that work in archives in the United States. Uh, with local archives, we really stay away from former programs such as uh, and I say this with due respect, Alliance for Progress, uh, Peace Corps, etc., where Americans and Europeans used to come with a very colonizing approach of we have the know-how. Now, for us, 
local knowledge and activating local knowledge and understanding how people do what they do, what resources they have, what's important to their community, what are their limitations is very important before setting the program. So everything that we do is based on consultation. Um, I'm going to show you a little video. It has no text, but you're going to see a lot of people mingling here, and this is a little bit, it's a summary that we had by 2000. 18 of how we operate and I, I just want you to pay attention that it will be very difficult to identify who is a student from the program, who is an American archivist, who is a local because of the way that we work. Can we please play this video? Thank you. Cristóbal de las Casas, he's getting prepared. This summer we work with an indigenous community called Fundación Promedios Comunitarios. They do a lot of local media with indigenous communities and they also uh, gather communities in the Chiapas area that, as you know, had the Zapatistas in the 80s and I will say that in the 90s and I will say that a big heritage from the Zapatista organization is that the concept of consultation gathers the legacy of the Zapatistas and the Zapatistas had already recycled the Maya way to operate the local indigenous communities that everything has to be per consultation and consensus. Um, so this um, is what we did with them. We set a rack for transfer of magnetic media to digital. We did a lot of digital preservation consulting. Uh, we work on metadata management and translation because they have a grant from UCLA, the MIAP and Danger program that requires that the metadata be in English and Spanish. Uh, we did a lot of cataloging consulting, trying to see uh, how we incorporate the memory and the way to identify and catalog from the community. So there is a system that you probably are familiar with, Mukutu, that was created in the States, that is particularly for indigenous communities, and it pays attention to traditional knowledge markers, what is agriculture, what is religious, what is sacred, what is related to food, etc. what images cannot be shown. Uh, and so it does, it is good for a lot of reparation of uh, how the Western world has approached from the ethnographical point of view many of these materials. And like, for example, we might decide, oh, I need, I am an anthropologist, I really need this photo of this indigenous Navajo community dead person. And you might find out that for the Navajos, you just don't show images of dead people. So it's, it's a long work. They didn't go for Mukutu because it's very complicated for them, but at least it was very reassuring to see that there are systems to catalog that includes their knowledge. And we did training, and when I say training is because I already mentioned that we don't do the, um, we don't do the savior thing of the, we have the know-how. Um, training goes both ways. So they also show us how they do sound landscapes projects, how they go out and collect sounds and, um, how they take care of what they have with the resources that they have. Mm. So this is um, the Apex 2022 team had people from Chiapas, the States, Canada, Cuba, Costa Rica, Colombia, Chile, Puerto Rico, Honduras. And we're not the only, we are the organizers, but we get a lot of supporters like Promedios Comunitarios, the Vulnerable Media Lab in Canada, Rit Pasa, that's the UNAM in Mexico, California Reveal, ABP, and UCLA Film and Television Archive. The ones that have an asterisk, it's very easy to work with them because they have former students of my program working. So in a way, they also work as ambassadors and they get resources to be able to do the project. Um, and so let's move a little bit. Let's, let's go to the YouTube again. Um, and I want to tell you why I'm so insisting, insisting so much in this reggaeton video. So let's play a minute, uh, 30 seconds from 521 to 556. And so we're still in the context part, okay? So this recent edited video by mega um, reggaeton celebrity Bad Bunny uses a back uses as background his son El Apagón, Gente Vive Aquí, the blackout. There are people living here to interweave the strong 
<laughs> the strong lyrics of the song with current and archival images of the history of gentrification, displacement, exploitation, extractivism, negligence, and other issues that Puerto Rico has endured over the years. The effects of global warming, the current politicization of electricity service, and the aftermath of the so-called hurricane season have a central role in this video that has been reproduced 563,000 times with 25,000 comments on the artist YouTube channel. The Bad Bunny phenomenon is also evidence on how political discourses have changed, the ubiquitous power of celebrities, and the effect that their sharing of social media platforms can have these days. So the original video is not about the blackouts in Puerto Rico. After the concert, he edited this to interweave a lot of political discourse because he is aware of how many people particularly young people, are following him in Latin America. Bad Bunny Summer 2022 concert was attended by 62,000 people and more than a concert. It was a social protest event that has gained more power after Hurricane Fiona last month. So this must be a little bit strange to us because I know that there is a lot of it's reggaeton, it's a culture that I cannot explain within the parameters of this presentation. And I know that it has enemies and it has uh, sympathizers. There's a lot of um, women exhibition, strong language, etc. But it's also youth culture. And for me, as a professor, youth culture is something to pay attention to. So central to it, there is a complaint that the notion that Poor countries, named them third world or global south, both terms are questionable, can take anything because they are resilient and they will rebuild. They will emerge from the ashes. Resilience and precariousness have become a burden and it is also something that is coming to the archives. So if you ask any Puerto Rican these days after Fiona hurricane, they tell you, no más, no más, no más, no, no more resilience, no more speech of the resilience. We need resources, yeah? We need money, we need funding, we need support. We're part of the United States, we're also a country in Latin America. Um, they, Puerto Ricans usually feel trapped because they are part of the states, but they are also a Latin American country, so they feel that they don't get the visibility that other countries get when they have natural disasters. Let's go back to the PowerPoint, please. So um, we have two kinds of disasters. We have many disasters in Latin America, but we have two that are very important for this presentation. On one hand, we have the national disaster. So I give you an example here. This is the Permanencia Voluntaria archive in a little town outside Mexico City. Mm. This was a self-funded initiative by Viviana Garcia Besne, who is the granddaughter of a former film producer from Mexico from the mid-century. She had organized the archive in a very intuitive way, putting her resources, asking for collaboration. Uh, Guillermo del Toro had supported her, Carlos Regadas had supported her, and then after the 2000, uh, 17 hurricane, everything came to the floor, everything was in disarray. At the moment, Viviana has decided, she used to have nitrate, she has decided to give the films to UCLA, uh, the film and television archive, and try to keep mentoring film production in the, in the little town. Um, we have some other examples here. This is a very, very highly recommended project that is in Escalar called Puerto Rico's Libraries, Archives and Museums Road to Recovery, a timeline of events after Hurricane Maria. This is done by Hilda Ayala, who is the current um, uh, technical director of the National Archive of Puerto Rico. And it's very important because the picture that you have in the background is the status of the archive after the Hurricane Maria in 2017. Uh, but then we also have political disasters, and I could name many, but many of you probably heard in the last years a lot of lobbying in favor of the Brazilian Cinematheque. This has been like chronicle, chronicle of a foretold death. Um, the Brazilian Cinematheque used to be one of the deans of Latin American cinema. And when I say cinema, I want you to know, because I know that you are mostly television people, that of course they also have TV archives. Uh, but the current ultra-right-wing government of Jair Bolsonaro has systematically been um, really uh, committing crimes against memory, 
in Brazil. So this is one of the examples. The Cinematheque got totally paralyzed during the pandemic. It was already on a strike, then the pandemic hit. The workers were fired, like 80% of the workers. They were not renewed their contracts, and people were struggling not only with the pandemic, like we all were struggling, but also with the lack of salaries. Uh, and then in uh, 2000, oh shoot, I deleted the number. 2018, we had a fire. No, I'm sorry. 2018, we had the fire of the National Museum. In 2021, we had the fire of a warehouse uh, that had a lot of administrative documents and student films from the Cinemateca. It was not the actual Cinemateca that burn, it was one of the bolts. And then, um, oh, back. This is uh, important because this is taken from all things linguistic. Uh, the National Museum lost around 400 open reel tapes that have never been digitized. And they had languages from indigenous cultures that are no longer spoken in Brazil that have never really been digitized, and we lost that, which is really world um, audiovisual heritage. And then we had more recent events. There was in September, in June this year, there was a police riot in the emerging Equatorian Cinematheque under the excuse that um, they were hiding weapons for social protest. They, had a, they have a very new director, very new to the world of archives, but he was very efficient in getting international attention. And so we had more political disaster. We had, for example, uh, Donald Trump's response to the Hurricane Maria in uh, 2017 when he visited and he threw paper towels at people and totally undermined the terrible situation of the island. So rather than talking about what archives and archives administration, because I think that the part of the political disaster is also the history of bureaucracy in the region. Uh, we come from, uh, co from a Spanish colonization, and Spanish is already a very colonial and bureaucratic country. We inherited that. So everything that is happening here is a shift because it was not happening before. And when I say generation, when I say generational shift, I am not necessarily talking about age. It's not ageism. It's not divided between old people and new people, but a new mentality that has to do, for example, with updating of knowledge. People that now realize, oh shoot. I have to update what I know about archives. People that are interested in the use of and the application of digital technologies. When in the past, we used to have a lot of administrators that, I mean, we have a good legacy of people that have done many good things, and I want to also honor their work. But we also have a lot of bureaucrats that they, they really didn't care for the archives. New administrative models, Latin American archives throughout the history had been very close to the national building discourse. So everything has to be about high culture and what we can show about our nature, our history, our heroes, our animals, our jungles, etc. So I think that there is also a shift in which a lot of people are coming to administration of archives that are less interested in these national discourses. There are also new distributions of labor. A little bit that a little bit of that has to do with the pandemic, a lot of remote work, a lot of freelancing that is problematic as we will see in the workshop. Um, there's also a lot of collaboration and community archiving. Uh, Cinematheques archives are trying to train people, common citizens, do more whole movie days, uh, community archiving, cataloging, so that people also do a little bit in curating their collections. Personal digital archiving workshops have become very popular for filmmakers, for creators, creators, for people in advertisement, for the students, because the amazing amount, I always tell my students, how many rooms will you need if you have to print everything that you have in your computer? Now, because we also have forget, forgotten the paper archive. Now, um, and then there's also a lot of awareness of indigenous knowledge and interest in consent, reparation, and respect for their sovereignty of images. And there is interest not only on film. Film was like sacred in Latin America for many years. Films were like 
highly associated to FIAF, to the International Federation of Film Archives. There is more attention now to television, advertisement, hybrid media, social media, web archiving. The new people that are coming onto archives are realizing this is also important to save. Um, and then, of course, there is a lot of interest in access, no more cryptic, difficult to access archives and participation of people in the governance of archives. Um, there is also like the construction of a lot of new buildings. If you have interest, I'm not gonna bore you with that. I published an article in the moving image about new buildings, new pathways towards dynamic archives in Latin America and the Caribbean, because since 2012, it's a coincidence, but we have seen the construction of a lot of new headquarters for archives and for Cinematheques. And so you have here four examples. Uh, clockwise, you have the Cinemateca de Bogotá that was opened in 2019. You also have the Cinemateca Uruguaya, the new building. These are not new Cinematheques. Cinemateca Uruguaya has existed from 1932. Henry Langlois went many times to Uruguay to look for lost films during the wars. Um, but the, the building is new. And then we have Lupa, which is an archive located at the Fluminense University in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, in the Cineteca Nacional that was expanded and updated during the uh, Felipe Calderón's government in 2012. So um, the, 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 the fact that they have new buildings does not necessarily translate that they have the most modern technology, and that's also very important to have, and it doesn't really mean that these buildings have come without a lot of citizen loving. The Cinemateca de Bogotá, for example, was sandwiched in between two major administrations, and the second major said, we don't need a new Cinemateca, and so we all have to hashtag, troll the major on Twitter, demonstrate, etc. This was also in the middle of the pandemic, so demonstrating going to the street was a little bit more difficult. And actually you see that there are like a green and a blue building behind. That was also going to be part of the Cinemateca, so we had to share the space with some university. Those are university residences and the the building of the Cinemateca and ended up being smaller than we expected and also is, is they're doing great job, but it, like they wanted to do more time-based media exhibits, and it's a little bit challenging because of the shape that the building gained at the end versus what they had planned. So let's go to the workshop. I'll tell you what I am doing here. Um, the way that I collected data for the comparison exercise that we are going to be doing today, um, I have stayed away from Google surveys because they are very impersonal. I'm taking the time to have conversations with people, Zoom, WhatsApp, long phone calls, if I happen to be in the country, visit, go for a, a drink, a cup of coffee. And so for this, for this exercise, I selected eight institutions in Latin America. Four out of those eight are cinematheques or museums, a museum of cinema. Four out of eight are university archives. I call them minor archives because they don't have like the national endowment. And one of them combines work with community archiving. One of those four universities is private, three are public. They all have television collections. I wanted to underline that because of my audience. But when I say television, it's also university television production, and it's also community media, community television. Four out of eight have film scanners. Film scanners are a luxury in Latin America, and so you know, I have a lot of friends here from European countries. I always get surprised the, and jealous of how people talk here about data mining and artificial intelligence and digitization, and all the wonders that you're doing, and I'm drawing now. Because for us, the challenge is that we have around 21, first, 21, 21 national archives in Latin America, and only around eight archives have uh, scanners, eight out of 21. A lot of archives do not own a magnetic media transfer unit yet. Yeah? And some countries do not have a national film archive. Peru is trying to, to build one, Costa Rica is trying to build one, Panama is trying to build one, Honduras is trying to build one. Uh, six out of these archives have magnetic media transfer units because 
the job situation sometimes is precarious and people want to say things, want to share knowledge. That's one of the reasons because they don't want Google surveys. Yes, you can put, I am not collecting, I am not collecting emails, but people feel very unsafe about the future of their jobs. And so they prefer to talk to me and being recorded and being there and like, no, 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 erase that, delete that. No, so like giving that control to people, you also get a little bit more honesty in the answers. But I did, uh, I do work on some privacy options. There are four privacy options. And the one is please keep my name anonymous. Please keep my name and the name of my institution anonymous. Three, please only use my name. Four, you may use my name and the name of my institutions. So seven out of eight said four, and then one out of eight said three, okay? So this is also important because you know these people might be the only job that they have. Jobs are difficult in Latin America. So you also, when you're doing research, you have to be very responsible with your findings. So this is my question one, and this is what I would like to see people together. So if we have three people, or two people for table. We have nine people, so probably if I have the three of you, if if I have three people here, and if I have if I had four people here, what I want to do is the following. I'm going to ask you exactly the same questions that I asked them, yeah, and we're going to compare answers. So the the first question that I ask is how does the notion of precarious apply to your institution? And so I gave them some cues. Think about, for example, precarious and personnel, precarious and tech endowment, facilities, office, archival storage units, shelving, general working infrastructure, salaries and job opportunities. Now, so you don't, I'm not gonna collect data here, so just get together, you have paper and pencil. If you need a sharpener, I brought one, yeah, uh, because these pencils are dying. And so let's get together and let's think about these three as if you were answering on behalf of your institution. And also, while you are doing this, try to predict what you think, what responses you're gonna get from Latin America, okay? So you have three minutes. Let's work, four people here. Yes. Yeah, we're very fucking privileged at uh, <laughs> the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. So, um, the only thing that we could uh, think of that could be precarious is our copyright situation because we don't uh, own copyright. And um, uh, there are uh, yeah, plenty of colonial collections in Suriname, Indonesia, and Curaçao uh, that are under threat. So it's one could say it's not part of our national history, but one could argue as well otherwise. No, I can't. I am a service provider. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, of course. We were talking about, um, well, likewise, we're a national audiovisual institution. Um, so we're relatively very privi privileged. Um, but the conversations still come up about personnel no matter the amount of people, there's never enough people. Um, and, you know, no matter the infrastructure, there's never enough infrastructure. And so, so, yeah, I think it comes up in relative discussions. But also being, talking about precariousness, we're often up to, sorry, is that better? Um, talking about precariousness, it's often up to uh, the government of the day based on the funding that we receive. So whether the government looks favorably at arts and culture or not can shift one way or another in Australia very quickly. So, yeah. Um, I'm from University of Cape Town and compared to other local universities we're actually doing really well except for the bit where we had a fire and burnt down last year so right now our facilities are really precarious because we don't have a permanent home and we don't have shelving and everything is still in crates and some of it's still wet and some of it's in cold storage and we're just yeah 
But aside from that, we're doing really well. showing are just to entertain you guys. They do not necessarily correspond to the archives that I interview. Uh, so this is community archiving in Puerto Rico. And even if I had permission, I'm not necessarily using their picture. So these are some questions to precariousness from Latin America, a lot of insistence on personnel, uh, the lack of permanent jobs. Most jobs are on temporal contracts. That means no benefits, no vacation. Uh, no free time pet, no opportunities for professional development. They cannot afford to come to these conferences and learn. Usually it's the director of the archive that comes and then the director decides to do tourism and be to the social hour. Uh, need to address wellness of the employees. This is particularly important after the pandemic because of course, if you don't know, you're gonna, the, thing, the, the way contracts work in most countries, you're hired from February to November. So you don't get a salary for December, January, you don't get a bonus, a, a December bonus. And so people are always like very stressed if they have kids. And it's also the impossibility of thinking of a life project. I wanna invest, I wanna buy a car, I want a dog, I wanna get married, I wanna do an MA, etc. Excess of bureaucracy uh, at the cultural institutions, that's considered precariousness. No, because it takes a lot of time. Post-pandemic wellness, remote work, but who is paying for the cell phone? who's paying for the internet, who is putting the equipment, because they send everybody to work at home, but they told them, use your computer, and use your hard drives, and use your cell phone. And people are working over WhatsApp. For me, it's amazing how people work over WhatsApp in Latin America. No, it's a little bit, because I, my students know, no, WhatsApp, no, nunca, no. I, unless they're dying, or something really bad is happening, then of course I'm human, I'll react. Um, and then as for facilities, all buildings not adequate for archives, small facilities, lack of humidity and temperature control. Hurricane season, this is really relevant in the Caribbean, blackouts, vulnerability of facilities, access to equipment. It's not only that the equipment is high cost, we have to buy a lot of things in European countries in the States and importing is very expensive. Uh, new buildings, yes, but it doesn't mean that they are totally endowed. Let's see if I have something else. Uh, this was a very important answer. Somebody told me, we don't have collection management policies. We look at other archives and there are, there are documents that are written. So it's very difficult to plan. Uh, and then the lack of awareness that archives are not only about audiovisual material, but we also have to do programming, curating, we have to do social media, we have to do publications, and all of this is increasing the amount of digital material that we have to take care of. Also, there's a lot of materials for this that were analog. Now, I get surprised of how little film festivals are saving programs anymore because everything is in social media. So you can consult the Cannes Film Festival at the Cinémathèque Francaise from 1956, but you chances are you cannot find the program from Mar de Plata from five years ago. Now, a lot of people say that the solution for lack of personnel are internships, but I oversee 20 internships every semester for my students. Internships for me had to be pet, had to be human, and had to be about audiovisual archiving. I always tell people that support my program, the internships that we want are not the Devil Wears Prada. My students are not supposed to go to a Starbucks to get coffee for you and they are not supposed to pick up your laundry. No, they have to be supervised learning about um, audiovisual. So let's go to question number two. Let's see, I, I'm gonna have to give you less time if I wanna get um, at least to the third question. Name, or two name one or two archival practices that are common in your institution and have unfold them for precariousness. And at the same time, you consider that those practices are environmental friendly. They can be do it yourself, equipment, equipment repairing, personal recruitment or hiring practices, recycling, repurposing or similar. Can you name something that you have done in your archive that you feel this is green and we handle to recycle, to be friendly here? I'm only gonna give you one minute this time. Yes, okay. Same group. This one answer? Here? Okay. Well, we're just trying to, the, just the concept of um, 
coming from gathering the information all the way through so that you're not repurposing and redoing the things again and again and again. So it's the same, you're adding rather than redoing. Um, this, they were mentioned here about um, equipment repairing and recycling of equipment and stuff like that. Um, and possibly then just having re recycling or repurposing policies that would probably all be doing in some shape or form. Yeah, I think that the repurposing is happening everywhere, which is a good thing. What about my my friends? Uh, so yes, we're look at Sanovision. We're looking at uh, the, the the energy and it, because the energy prices are really high, so we have to. Uh, so uh, the heating will we, we have the heating lower, and then we're trying uh, to find out uh, different kinds of getting the energy okay. uh, because. Um, uh, we need a lot of cold as well instead of heat. So, so you use solar energy? Yes. Okay. That's something that in a couple of buildings they're saying when they build the new buildings, they didn't really think about solar energy in the. Well, we are looking also at getting the warmth uh, from the uh, from a deep hole. I don't know what it's called in English, but it's like the deep uh, uh, ground storage. Yeah. So we are independent from the from the energy system which is difficult, of course, depending on what kind of soil you have and everything, but it could be a really good uh, solution. Yeah. But we're not doing that yet. It's something we are wishing to research. This is something that still needs to be researched in Latin America, and the geography is so changing yeah. that one solution cannot be implemented all over the place. And my friends here? We are different institutions, so quickly for us at, uh, in a training department, we implement more online training lastly because of the COVID, so I think it saves uh, transports and it allows more people to attend because they wouldn't have come um, in person. So that's one thing and there is another thing here. <laughs> yeah, the thing I was thinking of, sometimes like, ideally I, I would like to like train a model from scratch, but it's time consuming, we don't have enough uh, people, like we have a small team, so so then we search for open source solutions, pre-trained models, um, off the shelf stuff, and only fine tune it. Or, and that's much more sustainable because, I yeah, you don't like training a model from scratch costs a lot of energy, and yeah. yeah, so it's better to look into what's there, and yeah, then, then, then sort of creating new things. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Web training is very important because I will say that that was the silver line of the pandemic in Latin America, that we had so much learning through Zoom, Instagram, YouTube, etc. So let me show you some of the things that I, that I had learned. This is one of my favorite green archives in Latin America, the Laboratorio de Preservación Audiovisual LAPA in um, the university in Uruguay. Um, I actually really love this tables, most of the things that are here are recycled, but the tables is something that somebody scavenged from the old medicine school. Those are the tables that people used to use to read x-rays. And so he gathered like eight tables, fixed the lamps, and those are the ones that they used to revise film, to inspect film. They're really, really efficient. Then you also wanna see, you see like the blue container on the back, uh, and so these are some of the responses, homemade containers, uh, building and unbuilding equipment, relying on partnerships with local institutions for digital storage, designing our own training material, and then this is this, the answers that I have on my, the right are the most cynical person that I just love, that he said, we built this new building and there is no green policy, building was not planned with that in mind, not sure how much energy is consumed, nobody has checked, the rooftop could use some polar panels, we still need to implement recycling practices, a lot of equipment can be repurposed, but we will need more staff to experiment on that. And then his last response was very funny, going green, also demands resources and more hands. It is not only about putting a signature on your email, save a tree, yeah. So it's a very cynical response that I, that I love. I have one more minute. Um, yeah, I think we really need to learn that, so I think we have just one more final question. question? Yeah. 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 We started a bit late, and I love the workshop. Yeah, 
No, but this is this is a very because you don't need the group. You can tell uh, these are the uh, handmade containers out of polypropylene, and they're also doing some out of polyester for photography now. And so actually, this is something that circulates in Latin America. I think every single young archivist, new generation, has these origami bags to make containers for the films. Um, I also wanted to remind you, if you go to the Agu um, website and you look for that video, the Tras del Eclipse, you will see how ingenious they were to repurpose a telecine and convert it into a scanner. And their YouTube page is full of information. This is very easy because we don't have to consult in group. Um, and I will, f I will finish with this one and the next one. And in the next fiat, I will sell my product. Or you can call me and I will tell you, uh, what, you what, what, what it is about. I can, I can sell it over Zoom also. But if I tell you where are you in digitization in your institution, one, two, three, Four is advanced, five, five is, it, sorry, it lost the format. Z, one is nothing, three is intermediate, five is we have digitized everything. Where are you? Four, four, three, four, five, good. Three and a half, okay. And what about digital preservation practices? Four. One, four, four, three, okay. This is my last slide. I have more slides, but this is gonna be my last one. This is very surprising, yeah, that most people that have answered this conversation tell me that in digitization, they are in two or three. But in digital preservation, they consider that they are in three and four. And you might be wondering why, yeah? You remember that I talk about a generational shift, yeah? It's a result of that, that people that are working in archives right now are coming with better knowledge of how digital work works, and they are not digitizing unless they know that they can implement hand-to-hand -hand digital preservation systems. Now, because they have also inherited from the 90s and the 2000s, the rush of optical media. Uh, so a lot of people discarded VHS, umatics, and put everything in optical media already compressed. And we have to transcode a lot of optical media now. And then uh, a lot of people also digitize. And in an archive, you can have 16 external drives, no NAS no big storage system, and you cannot even identify what is there because there were, there were not nomenclatures, there were not schemas, and there were not checksums, uh, backups, etc. So I actually think that this is very positive. I was discussing this with Breck, and Breck was telling me, but we have to do the two at the same time. It's about money, and I think that it's very good that people are erring on the side of caution regarding this. Um, let me let me give you my email. Uh, I have more stuff to show you. <laughs> no, that's my product that I can sell you over the internet. It's fun. It doesn't cost money. Uh, it might take you to play. It might take you places. It might take you to Latin America with Apex. But this is my email, Juana at nyu.edu. I am on Twitter. I'm bitching all the time. Uh, and my the email for Apex is apex.meap at nyu.edu. We do take other people to Apex, so if you want to go with us, that's what I was going to sell you. Uh, I'll tell you how you can go with us, okay? Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It's a very inspirational workshop, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.